Okay. Thank you all so much for joining us to celebrate queer and trans migrations, dynamics of illegalization, detention, and deportation. My name is Heather, and I'm the publicity manager at the University of Illinois Press. And I'm just going to go over some brief logistical information and introduce our guests before we get started. First of all, thank you so much to our panelists for being here today. After me, Dr. Levade and Dr. Chavez will give a brief introduction. And then we will also play a video from Carolina Lopez at Mariposa Sin Fronteras. And then we will have short presentations from contributors Fadi Saleh, Maisha Aureliano, Ruben Zasina, and Sasha Wejeratni. Then we'll have time for a 20 minute Q&A at the end. You can enter questions throughout the event by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'd also like to thank Bookwoman Bookstore for partnering with us on this event. I'll put a link to their website where you can purchase the book in the chat box. Please support them. We will also be recording the event and posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. Watch our social media for an announcement. And now I will just briefly introduce Dr. Levade and Dr. Chavez. Dr. Levade is Professor of Gender and Women's Studies. She holds a PhD in Ethnic Studies from Berkeley, and her research focuses on the connections among queer lives, racialization processes, state immigration controls, and justice struggles. She served as the director of the Institute for LGBT Studies at UA from 2007 to 2011. Levade is the author of Pregnant on Arrival, Making the Illegal Immigrant and Entry Denied, Controlling Sexuality at the Border, both published by the University of Minnesota Press. She is the editor of Lives That Resist Telling, Migrant and Refugee Lesbians, a special issue of the Journal of Lesbian Studies, and Queer Migrations, a special issue of GLQ. Levade co-edited Queer and Trans Migrations, Dynamics of Legalization, Detention and Deportation, published by the University of Illinois Press, A Global History of Sexuality, published by Wiley Blackwell, and Queer Migrations, Sexuality, Citizenship and Border Crossings, published by the University of Minnesota Press. She has held fellowships at the University of Texas, Austin, and the University of Bristol. Dr. Chavez teaches, writes, and currently serves as chair in the Department of Mexican American and Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where she also holds several affiliate faculty appointments. Working with colleagues across UT's College of Liberal Arts, Chavez has been helping to create a new initiative called GRIDS, Gender, Race, Indigeneity, Disability, and Sexuality Studies designed to foster relationships among those who study these and other systems of power. In the summer of 2019, along with several amazing colleagues of color and white allies, Chavez helped found the new Michigan State University Press Journal, Rhetoric, Politics, and Culture. She has published three co-edited volumes, including Text and Field, Innovations and Rhetorical Method, published by Penn State University Press, a book of interviews called Palestine on the Air, a monograph titled Queer Migration Politics, Activist Rhetoric and Coalitional Possibilities, and co-edited Queer and Trans Migrations, Dynamics of Illegalization, Detention, and Deportation, all three of which are published by the University of Illinois Press. She's recently finished another monograph titled The Borders of AIDS, Race, Quarantine, and Resistance, which will be published by the University of Washington Press in 2021. And now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Levade and Dr. Chavez. Thanks again to everyone for being here today. I want to welcome everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm Ethna Levade, as Heather said. I want to thank you so much for being here today. I also want to extend warmest thanks to Heather for her tremendous work organizing today's event and other publicity, and to the University of Illinois Press staff who have been really amazing throughout every step of producing the book. I think Karma and I also want to thank the amazing contributors to this book, which has become a shared project that we hope provides tools and inspiration for transformation. Today, we were gonna tell you just a little bit about what prompted us to create the book. And that has to do with both the political and the historical moment that we're in and where scholarship and public discussions are at. And we'll also talk a little about why we thought it would be important to have academics, activists, and artists together and about the kinds of work that we hope this book can inspire. We decided to work on the book after we co-organized a conference on queer migration in 2014, which happened just before the so-called child migrant crisis that summer. We envisioned the book as a companion to Ethna's earlier co-edited volume, Queer Migrations, Sexuality, U.S. Citizenship, and Border Crossing, which centered queer of color migrants and communities and questions of border crossing and citizenship. 
My book, Queer Migration Politics, was also in print and widely circulating, as was a growing body of work in trans migration studies. So it seemed like the right moment to broaden queer and trans migration conversations to take up increasingly urgent issues of criminalization, detention, and deportation. We put out a call for papers for the book in 2017, as everyone was living with the dire effects of the latest rounds of racial capitalism, colonialism, settler colonialism, and state terror, all of them working through normative gender and sexuality logics. Under those conditions, millions of people around the world were continuing to be forced into migration. And yet countries like the United States that play a key role in generating migration, including through their trade and economic policies, through invasions, warfare, policies that continue to fuel the climate crisis and many other kinds of issues are not addressing their role in generating migration, but instead are further slamming their doors, building walls and criminalizing migrants. We know these responses have routed untold numbers of people into situations where they risk their safety and their lives. And they live under conditions of exploitation while remaining ineligible for the most basic assistance or care and remain vulnerable to separation from family and friends at any moment through deportation. We also know documented migrants are increasingly criminalized and routed into detention and deportation and that people seeking asylum are criminalized, penned up or driven out and subject to extraordinary levels of violence, terror and abandonment. And we also know that these logics and practices both stem from and further reinforce settler colonial, racist, heterosexist and anti-poor policies that are directed toward US citizens. Further contributing to the moment that we're in, there have been extraordinary levels of state and private investment in walls, cages, and surveillance, and in cruelty, brutality, unaccountability, and state and corporate lawlessness, even as basic collective goods and services like food, shelter, healthcare, and education are being made unavailable and people, both migrant and citizen, are experiencing what Elizabeth Povanelli calls economies of abandonment and dispossession. The pandemic has further deepened these dynamics. Media and politicians, whether Republican or Democrat, tend to frame migrants and marginalized US communities as somehow causing the current crisis. The contributors to this book flip the script and they call out the carceral nation state, corporations and white supremacist settler colonial and heteropatriarchal logics and practices as the source of the crisis and as needing transformation and abolition. All of the contributions in this book help us to analyze and understand the current structures of power that are creating these conditions of dispossession and suffering. They help us to make links among struggles so we can understand how the illegalization, detention, and deportation of queer and trans migrants connects with the movement for Black lives, feminist politics, and prison abolition. They help us make connections among struggles at different scales, from the most local to the global for nation state migration, detention, deportation, and security regimes draw from and cite one another to legitimate their actions, just like capitalism creates the scripts for countries and corporations alike to draw and exploit migrant labor and black, native, brown, female, poor, queer, and trans labor profiting at every step. Contributions to this book also document extraordinary histories of refusal, resistance, and dreaming and working toward a different world that's not just about surviving, but thriving. Starting not with rich white men, but with communities that have faced most harm under the current system. And they remind us that we all have a part to play in making change, which varies depending on your circumstances, but everything counts, everything matters, and every effort helps. The book acknowledges and honors important changes we have seen over the last two decades, including as queer and trans migrants are increasingly at the forefront of extraordinary social movements, organizing efforts and cultural work that has redefined how we understand and work for migrant and queer justice. 
In 2007, Queers for Economic Justice released Queers and Immigration, a vision statement, which envisioned transforming the immigration system in ways that centered the priorities of queer and trans people and communities that have been most harmed by the current policies. Since then, numerous activists, artists, and artivist groups have emerged. In the United States, these include, and I'm only listing some, <clears throat> the Trans Latina Coalition, Immigrant Youth Justice League, United We Dream, Culture Strike, which is now the Center for Cultural Power, the Queer Undocumented Immigrant Project, Mariposa Sin Fronteras, Familia Trans Queer Liberation, Trans Queer Pueblo, the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, the Black LGBTQ plus Migrant Project, and many others. And if you read through the contributor biographies in the book, you will see the extraordinary array of additional social justice projects and organizations that people have been working with. All of these efforts have made important inroads into checking the gender and sexual normativity of the immigration movement, setting queer and trans-centered migration agendas, challenging the treatment of trans and queer migrants in detention, and much more. This kind of work is also evident around the world with organizations like the Forcibly Displaced People's Network, the African LGBTQI plus migrant network, Rainbow Refugee, Queer Refugees Deutschland, and many others. In creating this beautiful book with a cover in original art by the amazing Julio Salgado, we didn't try to produce something that we claim is representative, which would be impossible, but instead issued an open call that invited grounded, cutting edge work that helps us to understand the moment we're in and how to move forward in transformative ways. Queer and trans migration remains heavy on, migrations remains heavy on contributors from and research about the United States. And this troubling overrepresentation reflects US power and hegemony in the production and circulation of academic knowledge. This book is not intended to suggest that US experiences are universal or generalizable. And contributors also engage processes of illegalization, detention, and deportation in places like Turkey, Greece, Canada, as well as Native nations. As Karma is suggesting, the book came about because of the urgency of the current situation, the need to continue having conversations and taking action, and the importance of ensuring the work remains centered on racial, gender, sexual, economic, settler, colonial, and geopolitical justice that begins from the priorities of those most harmed by the current system. We can certainly be glad that Donald Trump did not get a second term and that President-elect Biden has committed to taking some immediate action on immigration that will be helpful. And yet we know Biden's agenda is hardly radical and he will also face an uphill battle in making even more this changes. All of this means the work must continue in these times that are very difficult and yet offer possibilities. For example, people have been demanding big changes that were not part of public conversations even a few years ago. These include the demands to abolish ICE, abolish detention, abolish Homeland Security, abolish the police, abolish prisons, end racial capitalism, let migrants stay and rebuild communities to ensure not just survival, but well being for everybody. The book documents some of these histories and some of the tools that have helped to get us to this point. It is a work of love and of thanks and a call to keep going. All the royalties from the book will be donated to support the organization Mariposa Sin Fronteras, which has been doing this work for several decades now. So the next thing that we're going to share is a short video by the Mariposas that tells you a little bit about their work. Hola, buenas noches, ¿cómo están? Mi nombre es Carolina López. Uh, soy una mujer transgénero que forma parte de Mariposas Sin Fronteras. Mariposas Sin Fronteras es un grupo que apoya a personas LGBTQ. Nosotros apoyamos a personas uh, con personas LGBT con, con este, cartas de apoyo, cartas de recomendación. Eh, cuando tenemos la oportunidad, eh, la, la capacidad y el dinero para poder pagar fianzas, los apoyamos con vivienda. 
y es muy importante que sigamos haciendo ese trabajo porque desgraciadamente eh, las personas que hemos pasado por ahí sabemos cómo es el eh, eh, estar dentro de una detención. Eh, desgraciadamente es un infierno, para muchas de nosotras ha sido un infierno y este y el trabajo que hace, se hacemos es este es para poder sobrellevar esa vida dentro de esas detenciones. Y cuando estamos afuera también necesitamos este, este, esta ayuda que nosotros brindamos eh, y que gracias a ustedes hemos estado seguido haciendo. Uh, gracias Karma por la oportunidad de poder expresar y el poder es dejar saber todo el trabajo que hemos hecho y, y que vamos a seguir haciendo. Uh, muchas, muchas gracias por todo a todos ustedes. Espero que tengan un buen día. Sabemos que son, estamos en tiempos difíciles, pero también sabemos que debemos seguir luchando para que estos tiempos la pasemos de la mejor manera. Muchas, muchas gracias y espero verles pronto. Nuestro grupo está radicado aquí en Tucson, Arizona. Y eh, por favor, síganos en nuestras páginas y en nuestro sitio web. Mariposas sin fronteras, ¿ok? Gracias a Codex. Thank you so very much, Carolina. So I, it is my honor to introduce the four of the wonderful contributors to the volume. I'm going to introduce them all at once in the order in which they're going to speak. And then they have five minutes. They're going to tell you a little bit about what they worked on. Um, and so the order is going to be Fadi, who will talk about academic, an academic contribution. I want to especially thank Fadi, who is joining us from Berlin, where it is uh, two in the morning. <laughs> um, I wish we could send you lots of caffeine. Um, but I'm sure you're supplied and ready to go. Maisha will speak next. Maisha is a painter. Ruben is next and then Sasha. So here's a little of the biographies from the book um, for those of you who don't already know these fabulous people. Fadi is a PhD candidate at the Institute for Cultural Anthropology and European Ethnology at the University of Göttingen, Germany. I'm sure I said Göttingen completely horribly, so apologies. That's fine. <laughs> you, you will correct all these awful sounds when it's your turn, right? So that's cool. In his PhD project, he traces the recent emergence of Syrian LGBTIQ refugees as a constituency in discourses around humanitarianism, asylum, and queerness. In addition to his academic research, Fadi continues to work with many LGBTIQ organizations in Europe and across the Middle East and North Africa in a variety of consultancy, research training, and advocacy capacities. Our next speaker will be Maisha, and that part was easy. Here's what I don't know how to say. Maisha is a painter from Mexico City raised in the San Fernando Valley. At the age of 16, she led and completed her first mural project in, do you say Van, Van, Nuys? Van Nuys, California? You'll correct me. Van Nuys. Nice. Yeah, Thank nice. you so much. That was the word. I was like, how do I say this one? <laughs> Thank you, Maisha. Um, Arianas became an immigrant youth organizer and educator in the San Fernando community, and she has led several public art projects and collaborated with muralists throughout Los Angeles County. Our next speaker is made a contribution to the academic aspect of the volume. Uh, Ruben is a PhD candidate in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona. Born in El Salvador, he is on a constant search for home and he specializes in queer migration studies. His work appears in WSQ Women's Studies Quarterly, Constellations, a cu cultural rhetorics publishing space and Borderlines among actually a wide range of publications. His dissertation explores the relational politics of queer and trans migrants as imaginative acts of transgression that enable their survival. And never least, last but never least, Sasha Wijerethna, you'll correct me when it's your turn, thank you so much, <laughs> is the former organizing director at the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, 
working to build the power of LGBTQ API communities toward a world where all queer and trans people of color can thrive. Sasha is currently the executive director of CAF, organizing Asian communities, organizing working class Asian immigrants in China, Chinatown, excuse me, and Queens, New York City. Sasha has been part of a number of grassroots and national organizing campaigns and deeply believes in the power of organizing to win impossible battles. They are confident we have what we need to transform ourselves and our world and that working class immigrants and people of color organizing will get us free. Sasha has been part of a variety of organizing and political education projects, including South Asian Youth Movement, No Dane County Jail Coalition, Vigilant Love, Asians for Black Lives, DC Desi Summer, Queer South Asian Network, and many more. So um, I can't wait to hear from these four fabulous contributors. Fadi will begin us. Thank you so much, Edna, for the introduction, and thanks a lot for, um, and Karma as well, for having me here. Um, I'll start. You'll tell me when I have one minute left. My contribution is titled Resettlement as Securitization, War, Humanitarianism, and the Production of Syrian um, LGBT um, Refugees. And my chapter is based on ethnographic field work conducted in Istanbul between 2014 2015 with Syrian LGBT refugees who, instead of heading to Europe, by sea decided to stay in Turkey and seek international protection through the third country resettlement program of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. So in this chapter, I do focus on that, on how this encounter with UNHCR resettlement scheme partially shaped discourses around Syrian LGBT refugees as both a favorable and exceptional group on the one hand. And on the other hand, I demonstrate how this um, this course of exceptionalism is problematic, inaccurate, and is often harmful to the livelihoods and asylum cases of many Syrian LGBT refugees. And to achieve this, I specifically follow the cases of several Syrian gay men in Turkey who were referred for resettlement in the United States specifically. And I focus primarily on their interviews with the Department of Homeland Security um, at the end. And with that, I contend that UNHCR, far from being a neutral humanitarian institution, is part of a securitization apparatus that is complicit and invested in producing Syrian LGBT refugees, not just as proper, you know, Western LGBT subjects, but also as secure, non-threatening, um, and non-terrorist subjects whose resettlement hinges upon their ability to produce narratives of sexual injury that are completely detached from the ongoing war and conflict in Syria. And maybe some background. I mean, Syrian refugees in Turkey are governed um, by what is called the Temporary Protection Regulation, which bars Syrians in general from seeking international protection through UNHCR. However, a select few who are considered particularly vulnerable can register for resettlement. And one of these groups are Syrian LGBT refugees who emerged as a de facto vulnerable group in 2014 and were allowed to register if they could prove that they have a well-founded fear of persecution due to sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and so after a few successful resettlement stories at the very beginning, news spread of how Syrian LGBT refugee cases were, ex were being expedited um, and how some of them were resettled in phenomenal times in comparison to other groups. With this, a discourse of exceptionalism started to emerge, which often went something like this. So unlike their heterosexual or non-LGBT counterparts, Syrian LGBT refugees were considered exceptional and desirable refugees. So this exceptionalism discourse intensified in 2014-2015 with the emergence of ISIS and during the pinnacle of the so-called refugee crisis. And the binary opposition of Syrian heterosexual versus LGBT refugees started to gain ground whereby single heterosexual male Syrian refugees were portrayed as security threats and potential terrorists, whereas Syrian LGBT refugees were automatically then produced as secure, non-terrorist and desirable future citizens of their resettlement countries. So Syrian heterosexuality was associated with war and terrorism, while Syrian queerness with security and future citizenship, at least in the media discourses um, um, on the outside. However, I argue that this exceptionalism discourse and this binary di division that different media perpetu perpetuated about UNHCR 
and their favoring of Syrian LGBT refugees was not how things always functioned within the humanitarian space of the UNHCR, which is what I will talk sh shortly about now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, due to the temporary protection regulation, Syrians in Turkey were not allowed to seek international protection because of the ongoing war. So because of, they could not name war as a reason for, uh, their, for, for their, their um, registration at UNHCR. Syrian LGBT refugees were allowed to seek asylum due to persecution based on sexual orientation and gender identity. With that, however, Syrian LGBT refugees inhabited a contradictory position because although they escaped Syria and, um, and, and although seeking asylum became a thinkable possibility first and foremost due to the ongoing war, they were expected to completely detach their narratives of persecution from the ongoing war, which became a problem for many Syrian LGBT refugees because they're both Syrian and LGBT. Such a binary logic of either war or homophobia assumes that war and the ongoing conflicts have um, no effect on what counts as gender, sexuality, or identity for Syrian LGBT refugees or within um, the Syrian context. Um, and many of my interlocutors um, actually spoke um, um, uh, during their interview uh, that during their interview spoke about the intensive questioning by DHS about their political positions, religious denomination, involvement in the war, military service, their interactions with army groups, and their opinions on the ongoing conflict, um, which was really interesting because they were not asked at all at some point about sexual orientation and gender identity, um, which made securitization um, the primary focus of a lot of the interviews, especially after 2014. Um, and so those whose narratives did not avoid talking about war as inextricably linked to their sexual and gender identities and their narratives of sexual injury, which was the case for so many people, um, those people um, became unintelligible um, to the decision makers as proper LGBT subjects and were thus considered either inel ineligible for resettlement or had their cases indefinitely pending. Um, with that, I, 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 with that uh, background, I do conclude my chapter by arguing that we do need then more work that goes beyond the humanitarian aspects of UNHCR's resettlement scheme and that explores a central role, role as a securitization assemblage to which various resettlement countries offshore their security apparatuses and war on terrorism, and through which they further fortify um, their already thick borders. Moreover, um, I, finally, I argue that further critical theoretical and ethnographic intent interventions into resettlement need to maintain an intersectional analytical lens that allows for different migration and flight narratives to emerge, other queer histories to be heard and resettlement policies to achieve what they were meant for protection and not exclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. And we will get to ask questions in the chat, which is a good thing because there's so much to talk about. Maisha is next. Would you like me to keep time and give you a warning or you don't need that? Yeah, that, that will be helpful. I have this too. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, uh, first of all, thank you all for doing, doing what you do for, and for sharing it, which is huge, um, and, and um, Karma and Etna for, for inviting us, for inviting me um, to be part of the project and of the book launch. Um, so my contribution is a painting called uh, Deferred Action, which is sort of a, a play on DACA. It actually looks like the, the work permit that, that um, we got with DACA. And I got my DACA about, about two years after, after it was uh, sort of announced because of my my record protesting and that's that brought a lot of uh, division uh, DACA was great for 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 undocumented youth in in the in a sense that it offered a protection and an opportunity to to work legally but it also created a huge division where like where the priority was even more so on anyone who didn't qualify for DACA and 
well, what's really problem what's really problematic about that is that that includes a lot of the people who were literally um doing things like civil disobedience and like who just had been part of the conversations for for a while but just aged out so it left out a lot of the people who who basically made it real um who made it happen and i think that that connects to to the way that the u.s handles um or uses actually the 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 criminal <laughs> "Quote unquote justice system as a way to to divide like the deserving the undeserving um, and even even uh, with DACA even having a protection if basically if you're criminalized you're 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 not deserving of those opportunities so even if the opportunities are quote unquote available by being put by being criminalized you're excluded and that I mean. And that that includes, like directly, directly, people of color, queer people, like differently abled people, like by default, by criminalizing, by making that that divide. Um, it le legitim legitimizes that divide, um, and I think it's very important to for us to continue ch challenging that beyond uh, administrations because that's how Obama got away with record record um number deportations by like making that divide of like deserving and deserving of who's a priority who's not a priority and what trump did was basically throw more people under that under under that um sort of classification of criminalized right of criminal people like now everyone's a criminal unless you have money so it's not really about like moving that line of like who's deserving, undeserving, criminal, not criminal. It's about like really questioning that line and destroying it, dismantling it. Um, and I think, again, um, I'm not undocumented anymore, but I, 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 as a permanent resident, I see that, that being criminalized puts you in a, in a whole different category, even even while not being undocumented, while it is a huge protection to to not be, you know, it on that line of like uncertainty, there's still a category. Like even after after documentation, like the record stays, and it, it caused a bunch of problems with 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 my case. And I've seen it with, like I said, people. This the painting depicts some of the sittings, and I know some of those people are still struggling with their cases, and their cases also related like unrelated to the actions just from being people from you know making mistakes from from being put in categories and in difficult positions where the choices are very you know very very difficult and and not obviously good or bad and yeah that's that's my contribution and it's very it's very personal because while I was painting it, I was an organizer, a community organizer. So my art is very different from my organizing. Like I always had to juggle between the art and like the the activism. So like I wouldn't consider myself an artivist because my organizing was where I, was what I was prioritizing, and my art was sort of my own space to to um, process what was going on. So in a way, this painting is is. Um, it's kind of a my document of, of that time of, of what DACA meant to to myself and, and 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 the organizers that I connected with across across the, the country. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Ru Ruben. Um, so like everyone, um, this is a beautiful panel with fabulous people. I am honored. Um, also, uh, Maisha, thank you for sharing. Um, also, I'm formerly undocumented and now I have the privilege of permanent residence. And, you know, like, it's like a weird deal because it really challenges how we view the world and how we exist. Um, and I think it's a privilege that needs to be recognized. Um, so my chapter is titled Shameless Interruptions. Um, and the chapter contribution focuses on two events in which trans and queer migrants interrupted private festivities to call attention to structures of power and were subsequently shamed by dominant LGBT communities. So what I'm talking about in the chapter is when Jenny Gutierrez interrupted Barack Obama at a Pride reception in 2015 
And when the organization Transcript Pueblo interrupted Phoenix Pride in 2017, because there's a lot of um, moments of um, resemblance between these two. And overall, the chapter explores these shameless interruptions as survival strategies that trans and queer migrants enact when shame alienates them from LGBT public and private spheres. And in the chapter, um, I argue that shameless interruptions are effective, performative, and temporal strategies that challenge the constraints of normative belonging within LGBT politics and that ask us to linger with the possibilities of temporal disruption. And for today, I'm just going to read a very brief um, excerpt from a section called Trans Latina Survival. Um, and it's on Jenniset Gutierrez's interruption. So Jenniset Gutierrez is a trans Latina activist and co-founder of Familia, Trans Queer Liberation Movement in Los Angeles, California. This organization works for the collective liberation of Latinx communities through advocacy and education. She received national attention for interrupting Barack Obama on June 24, 2015 at a White House Pride reception celebrating Pride Month and the accomplishments of the LGBT community under the Obama administration. In a room full of white gay men taking selfies and applauding Obama for his leadership on LGBT issues, uh, Gutierrez's words and actions critique the discrepancies between the normative LGBT accomplishments and the dire living conditions of undocumented trans women under President Obama, otherwise known as the Porter in Chief. She said, President Obama, release all LGBTQ from detention centers. President Obama, stop the torture and abuse of trans women in detention centers. President Obama, I am a trans woman. I'm tired of the abuse. I'm tired of the violence. As Gutierrez spoke, a majority of the audience members began to shush her and Obama immediately responded with, listen, you're in my house. As a general rule, I am just fine with a few hecklers, but not when I'm up in the house. A telling moment of this moment is when Obama, echoing the audience's response and sentiments, told Gutierrez, shame on you. While Gutierrez could have ended her interruption of Obama early, her refusal to accept public shaming lays bare new possibilities for trans and queer migrants to resist the lure of normative belonging. Her shameless performance also demonstrates the labor of shame in making distinctions between racialized bodies and white bodies in LGBT communities. In a YouTube video uploaded by the Not One More campaign, we can grasp Gutierrez's shameless interruption when she shouts phrases such as, I am a trans woman, I am tired of the abuse, stop the abuse, President Obama, demonstrating no shame in articulating the violence of U.S. immigration control Gutierrez draws from her pain and anger to interrupt the scene of nationalism. As the scene unfolds, Gutierrez begins chanting, not one more deportation, ni una más deportación. It is worth noting that neither the audience nor Obama ever took the time to listen to Gutierrez's words or treat her with respect. Rather, they filled the room with chants that celebrated masculinist nationalism, such as Obama, Obama, Obama. They also ruthlessly booed Gutierrez and the word shame was continuously heard throughout the room. Towards the end of the video, a voice appears behind a person who is filming the event saying, enough, this is not for you, this is for all of us. In several ways, this moment contextualizes Gutierrez's shameless performance within a space that celebrates whiteness in a patriarchal construction of gay sexuality and citizenship. The statement, this is not for you, this is for all of us, reveals that undocumented trans women like Gutierrez are outside the realm of the us. The statement makes explicit the exclusion of trans Latina migrants from LGBT communities. Not surprisingly, Gutierrez was kicked out of the event, but as she was escorted out of the room, she continued to, to chant, not one more deportation, ni una más deportación. Even while being shamed and booed, Gutierrez behaved shamelessly to mobilize a trans Latina critique against the wishes of liberal white citizens. Her shameless interruption does not ask for rights, but instead demands liberation from intersecting systems of oppression. As she continuously reminds us, her existence is indeed resistance. Thank you so much. Folks, you have to buy the book because you just got to see a little bit about all these amazing different parts. And now you need to read and see, read the whole thing, see the artwork, hear the fullness of the story Sasha is going to tell us a little bit about. Hi, folks. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be in the space with you all. Uh, so the name of my piece is From Potlucks to Protest, Reflections from Organizing Queer and Trans API Communities. Uh, it's a little bit of a different piece. It's grounded in some of the organizing that, uh, that I and a number of the other people were doing 
uh, through NCAPIA, the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. Uh, so the focus of this piece is around the criminalization of trans and queer Asian communities who are always assumed to be immigrant and the organizing possibilities that come from that. Uh, one kind of big intervention is that I think we often see Asian communities as sort of a step away from whiteness. Um, and that's, I think, often how Asian communities and API communities are seen from the outside, but it's also often sometimes how we see ourselves and particularly when organizing in these communities isn't grounded in working class, in working class communities. And so I think one of the places we say that a lot is in the way that uh, Asians for Black Lives spaces are often framed and they're both deeply important and incredibly necessary spaces. And depending on how they're run, they're certainly uh, spaces that don't do this, but they will. The, those spaces will sometimes assume that uh, we're sort of following a white allyship model where we're just coming in to support a community uh, that's more oppressed than we are. And while that's true, it fails to really ask people to think and to ask us as Asian people to think about the ways that we are impacted by racism, by transphobia, transphobia by queerphobia, and to really draw a much deeper and more meaningful and longer lasting solidarity that builds real relationships and, and comes from a real shared material interest. Uh, in fighting transphobia, in fighting queerphobia, in fighting anti-blackness, in fighting racism. And so part of what we, what we were trying to do at NCAPIA was to really center trans and South Asian and Muslim experiences of profiling. Um, and one of the sites, which comes with a lot of privilege, but was, was at the airport uh, and, and through TSA and, and through that uh, was really targeting the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and I think the other point in this piece is that, it, that uh, organizing in that way really allowed us to enter the work through people's stories. So when we started asking, the stories that we heard were of people having electronics held and surveilled for hours, being targeted for entrapment by people who they believed later to be informants, trying to sort of entrap them into saying something that could then be prosecuted later, later on, um, getting locked into rooms during a supposedly normal TSA search, having trans bodies really invasively examined when they didn't fit the gender expectations of a TSA agent, and all of these other stories that I think allowed us to enter solidarity work from a very different place that both allowed for deeper relationship building and also for transformation of the people doing the organizing, right? To really be in the work from a place of solidarity and also for their own liberation and own safety. Um, actually, I will leave it at that. Thank you so much to our fantastic presenters. Um, at this point, we got to say a little bit and we're going to open up and Karma is going to manage the chat and uh, let's hear some of the questions and comments. So give you a couple of minutes if you have some questions to put up in the, the Q&A and actually you can really do questions in two places. One, uh, you can submit questions uh, in the chat or uh, at the bottom of your screen on the far right, there's the Q&A little uh, button and you can submit questions there and uh, we'll go ahead and get those answered. Um, I just wanted to reiterate and I'm gonna put it actually in the uh, chat right now uh, that all of the proceeds for our book uh, go to the Mariposa Sin Fronteras. Uh, you heard from Carolina at the beginning talking a little bit about the important work that they do to support people when they're detained. Um, many of you probably know that the detention centers and I mean, they're bad everywhere, but they're very notorious in uh, Arizona. And so the support work that they provide for folks while they're inside those centers and then the work that they do um, on the other side, I think is um, just really important. We're really just excited to, to support them. Uh, with whatever this book might make. Um, and then just relatedly to, to reiterate uh, that uh, my hometown uh, bookstore, Bookwoman, uh, is also sponsoring this event tonight. And so uh, I believe Heather put the, the link to Bookwoman to be able to buy the book at the start. And so um, if you would consider, if you're gonna buy the book, if you would consider buying it through Bookwoman, uh, and support a local bookstore or through your own local bookstore. We would really appreciate that as well. Um, so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pose a question 
uh, to the, the panelists. Um, and first of all, I'm just so grateful to have you all here. And we felt like we had really the dream team of uh, authors and artists in this um, book. So it's just wonderful to see some of you here together. Um, and so um, I guess I just want to ask if uh, you want to talk any at all, any of you, maybe a couple of you can say where the work that you were uh, doing then or the thinking that you were doing then in your piece or your chapter, where you are with it now, um, maybe the directions you've gone uh, since you completed your piece, because all these pieces, of course, were completed something like a, over a year ago. Does anyone want to take that up? I could maybe start saying something. Thank you, Fadi. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, I, I mean, unfortunately, I've, I, I've been telling people about how I wrote this piece like a few years, a few years ago, and it's based on field work that was done 2014, 2015. But it's, it's very sad that every time I go back to Istanbul and I talk to people, um, it seems that the conclusions, unfortunately, have not changed, or my conclusions have unfortunately not changed. And so many people are actually still stuck exactly because of the same dynamics of making the mistake of mixing, you know, different narratives that are not supposed to go there, especially the one with war, especially that one is horribly notorious. And um, for because of that, um, I'm considering working now, but with other people in, in Turkey to do something about this actually, and especially with Elif, who's also one of the contributors, um, Elif Sari, um, to, the, um, to, the, um, to the book as well. Um, so we're actually trying to take it together somewhere else, um, probably a bit more political rather than just writing, um, but we'll have to see, um, but yeah, so, you know. Thank you, Fadi. Sure. Um, for me, um, it's interesting because again, these things come back again. The election, um, at least the, the short excerpt I read about Jenny Sal Gutierrez, that was during the Obama administration. And right now, as we know, the Biden cabinet um, might have Cecilia Munoz, I think that's her last name, um, who was one of the terrible people from Obama um, that really influenced and increased the deportation regime that we have um, that, again, is just not humane, um, does not provide dignity, respect, or anything for migrants. Um, so I think for me, thinking about the activist tools that people like Genisa Gutierrez and Transcript Pueblo provide us, um, the necessity to interrupt, um, to disrupt time, and to really think about how we align ourselves to the nation state and citizenship, and how we can disalign ourselves um, from it um, in some small moments of interruption, I think are more relevant than ever. Um, now that, again, grateful that Trump is not <laughs> gonna be here for four years, but also um, the Biden cabinet, um, we know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, some of the questions that are coming in from the audience that I think really connects, Ruben, with where you just finished your, your comments. Um, and so these two questions are, are related and I'll open it up and maybe Sasha and Maisha, if you wanna uh, take the first uh, go at it, you can. Um, so uh, one question, uh, thanks is for an amazing session and asked for us to think more about uh, resistance and the ways we chart it. Um, she says, given your work and your lived experiences, how do we think about resistance more broadly? Like what are some of the key pieces of what resistance means? And I think that relates to the another question we have, which says, you know, sort of bluntly, so how do we change this? How do we break this out, find our way to better ways? Uh, so let's, let's talk about um, change and, and resistance. Um, and uh, I'm sure, Maisha, one of you want to take this first? Yeah, okay, go ahead, Maisha. Oh, sorry, it was, it was breaking off a little bit. Um, I think uh, it, with, in my, my experience, I, resistance is kind of harsh on, on directly impacted people. So I think it's, it's um, I, I, I kind of envision resistance where the, the load doesn't fall all on, on on people who are being affected by by the same things that we're trying to change 
I think that's that's really really important in 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 how we shift resistance and also for directly impacted people to not always feel like like resistance and and protest uh, protesting and 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 changing things has to look a certain way you know it can also be personal and especially like in art like that's it's really important to to support people who make who make not only protest work but also personal because that's also another way of of sort of communicating in, in a different way that doesn't involve the English language so definitely more more visuals more more out of creating culture not just not just uh, protesting within 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 like American culture whether it be language or visuals or that context yeah and to add on to that I think um, something that I think a lot of that that I've said a lot I've heard a lot particularly uh, in relation to the election are that like there are no shortcuts to organizing and there are no shortcuts to building power and so like we like, yes, there's a win that we got Trump out of office and we kind of just got ourselves back, like Ruben was saying, to the same conditions we were in four years ago that weren't great for our people. And, you know, as much as the mass mobilizations are incredible and are beautiful, there are also, there are no short, even, and even though our time is short as climate change happens, there are no shortcuts to organizing. And so we have to go, we have to do the really hard and steady work of organizing people into formations, into organizations, of building people's leadership, preparing people to actually be able to govern, right? That there's, and it's not going to happen overnight. And it would be great if we were farther along in that than we are, but there is no way to make that up. And so I think there just is, there's such slow, steady work to build the forces that we actually need, like fighting forces of working class people, like Maisha was saying, of people who are not directly impacted too, uh, but that we're, we're, we're still in the fight of our lives. And I think there, like, there's no easy answer to that question, right? Like, what do we do is that we jump into the slow and steady work of organizing the people around us to be ready to fight and to take on the fights that are coming. Also, I think yeah, with resistance to, oh, sorry. No, go um, ahead. So I, I'm a little delayed, so I was going to bring you in. So go for it. Um, I think to piggyback on Maisha and Sasha, like one, it's slow um, and you have to keep going at it again and again. And like Maisha said, I think also who's most impacted? Because, you know, when I wrote the piece about shameless interruptions, I was angry. Um, because if you look at dominant LGBTQ media, allies, um, community, um, people were calling these activists hecklers, like Jenny Sal Gutierrez, like any, the advocate, there were a lot of think pieces where people were just calling her a heckler. Um, and the scene that I analyzed is a scene of violence, is transphobic, racialized violence um, that I was narrating. And I think um, while, yes, the resistance is owned, I think it's also important to recognize that, again, like, um, it's complicated because we can't romanticize resistance too much just because, again, there are lived effects and these are scenes of violence. Um, so it's hard, like, as we narrate resistance and talk about resistance, it's also important to recognize, again, what violences are occurring in these moments of activist disruption. Mm -hmm. Fadi, do you have anything that you want to contribute to this discussion about change and resistance? I mean, it's, to be honest, it's always difficult coming from Syria or talking about Turkey um, to discuss topics such as resistance. Um, and I'm listening to a lot of what you're saying. And a lot of the time, and recently, I mean, we keep on thinking about this and a lot of the broad resistance that we think about is really just making sure that people are primarily safe, making sure that, you know, it's it, it's okay not politic not to politically organize, not to be too public about certain things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It seems to be going the other direction when I think of contexts like Syria and Turkey, because um, I think um, it is very important for, uh, unfortunately, in in a context of permanent war, um, you know, sometimes just living and making sure you're fine um, is the best we could think of at this point. Um, but I think it's also very important just to mention that. Uh, thanks. Yeah. 
you. Fadi. Etna, did you have anything that you wanted to say? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we do have another question, just, uh, and maybe this is just quick. Uh, someone is asking if anyone is working on uh, the deaths of trans women in detention centers uh, under the Trump administration. Is there any of us who are doing that work? I think, um, you know, one of our contributors is uh, Bambi Salcedo uh, uh, from the Trans Latina Coalition. And uh, so she's not here with us tonight, but we did event a couple weeks ago. And so, um, you know, that organization uh, is doing a lot of work to uh, support trans women more broadly. So not necessarily uh, focused on death, but on supporting live trans women. And I think uh, Mariposos is doing that work too, um, for sure. So we have uh, just a couple minutes left. Are there any other uh, questions to come in uh, from the audience or, or if there's anything that one of our panelists would like to say to kind of wind down our conversation? Well, in terms of the last question, it was my understanding that the uh, Transgender Law Center was suing the Trump administration over the death of Roxana Hernandez. Um, and in terms of the moving of trans women out of Cibola, New Mexico to other sites, um, there's a range of kinds of um, efforts to mobilize care and resources, but also to contest, you know, because rather than addressing the conditions in Cibola and ending detention, what they simply did was shuffle people off to other places where the, the situations continue. So um, there is absolutely um, important organizing going on in response to that. So uh, we're one minute to the top of the hour. That makes it a 3 a.m. and Berlin, where Fadi is. Um, Heather, did you do you want to come back in at all uh, on this point? I just want to say thank you all so much. This has been a really wonderful event. Um, we really appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you so much, Fadi, for staying up. Um, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, please, please support Book Woman. Um, they're an amazing bookstore in Texas. Um, and there's a link in the chat. Um, we'll also send you, um, you'll get an email after the event um, that will have a link to where you can purchase the book directly from them. Um, we'll be uh, we've recorded this event, and we're also going to post it on our YouTube channel. Um, so we'll try to get up that that up tomorrow. Um, and any final thoughts? I want to say thanks to the uh, audience thank you, for Heather, tuning so much for all the work in. You did. I want to thank Heather and the University of Illinois Press who have been amazing. And I want to thank our panelists and the opportunity for, to have this conversation at this difficult moment with these amazing people. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Karma. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, please, uh, yeah, support undocumented artists. And like, that's, that's a hustle and that's, sort of artists sort of this or other other space to to create a, a path you know that path that lags like that's art so supporting documented artists and yeah thank you Maisha all right thank you all so much uh, we really appreciate it have a have a wonderful night thank you you too thank you right. good night Ciao. good night everyone bye